It was Sunday morning in Washington, D.C., and I had just returned from a leisurely stroll to grab a cup of coffee. As an agent for a highly classified division of the FBI, dealing with otherworldly creatures wasn't exactly the most conventional line of work, but it definitely kept things interesting. I sipped my caramel macchiato, ready for a day off, when my phone rang with an urgent call from my superior, and my unwillingness to work faded into determination. Sam, we've got an emergency on our hands. You need to get to Stoll, Kansas, now, he demanded, his usually calm demeanor replaced with urgency. Within three hours, I was at the scene of the crime in Stoll, a small, unassuming town where nothing disturbing ever seemed to happen. Upon arriving at a dilapidated church that had become the center for the recent gruesome discoveries, I spotted several fellow agents scattered around the crime scene. My partner, Mike, approached me hesitantly. You're not going to believe what happened here last night, he whispered, trying to keep his composure. He led me towards the entrance of the church, but before we entered, he warned me, be prepared, it's unlike anything you've ever seen. Inside lay four mutilated bodies that appeared to have been torn apart by something ferociously powerful. Their entrails spilled across the floor like a twisted nightmare come true. They were brutally assaulted in ways we'd never witnessed before. As we began our investigation, more and more local townsfolk painted a disturbing picture. Eyewitnesses reported seeing well-dressed men wearing sinister grins wandering the streets late at night. Others spoke about hearing hypnotizing melodies floating in the air, as if luring innocent victims to their demise. I questioned one of the victim's husbands, who could barely speak through his tears. She said she heard a song so beautiful that it made her forget everything else. She followed it into the night, and I never saw her alive again. A shiver ran down my back as fear mingled with confusion. What was capable of inflicting such carnage? Who or what was our antagonist? As Mike and I sat there discussing the details of the case, we heard the faintest sound, almost a whisper of music, drifting through the air. We exchanged bewildered looks, the hairs on our arms standing on end. Follow it, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. We raced into town, our footsteps echoing in the dark and desolate streets. The melody grew louder as we approached a barely lit alleyway. Anticipation clouded every moment. Cautiously stepping into the shadows, we encountered three cloaked figures that seemed to materialize from thin air. Their unnaturally elongated limbs ended in razor-sharp talons that twitched with anticipation as they beckoned us closer. With guns drawn, we slowly advanced towards them. The atmosphere had changed. We felt ourselves being drawn in against our will by their haunting melodies. My heart pounded in my chest as sweat broke out across my forehead. At once, the beings lunged at us. I squeezed the trigger only to hear an empty click. Mike groaned in pain as one of them slashed his arm. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I threw myself at another figure to free my partner from his painful grip. The impact sent both of us crashing to the ground. Its talons dug deep into my shoulders as its nightmarish laugh cackled in delight. With the creature's talons digging into my shoulders, I struggled to focus on a plan of action. The eerie melody continued to play, making it difficult to concentrate on anything else. Mike managed to push his attacker away and hurried over, attempting to pull the creature off me. We were desperately outnumbered, fighting a losing battle against these monstrous beings. As Mike fumbled with his weapon, I realized we weren't going to win this fight alone. We needed reinforcements. With great effort, I reached for my phone and dialed our superior's number as quickly as my trembling fingers could manage. Hearing the urgency in my voice, he agreed that the situation was dire and promised additional support within minutes. As we waited, which felt like an eternity, Mike and I tried our best to keep the creatures at bay. When help arrived, they found us battered, bruised, but alive. We had successfully fought off the creatures long enough for reinforcements to join us and force them back into hiding. The scene around us was one of chaos. Broken windows, damaged buildings, and evidence of the nightmarish battle that had just occurred. Once we could breathe more easily, knowing that the immediate danger was over, we began piecing together information about these sinister beings that had invaded Stull. Talking with experts and consulting ancient texts from around the world, we discovered that these horrifying creatures were known as sirens. Sirens were once believed to be enchanting women who lured sailors to their deaths with their hypnotic voices. However, in reality, they were not humans at all. Rather, 
they were otherworldly beings whose haunting melodies entwined with horrifying appearances struck terror into those unfortunate enough to encounter them. As we delved deeper into our research, we came across a group of rare artifacts with inscriptions detailing a means of repelling sirens by disrupting their lethal songs. With no time to waste and lives on the line, we gathered these items and went on the offensive, seeking to end this menace once and for all. Our final confrontation with the sirens took place in an abandoned warehouse near the edge of Stahl. Whispering with a hidden confidence, I recited the sacred incantations, disrupting their melody and stripping them of much of their unholy power. This time, we had the advantage, pushing them to retreat. But instead of vanishing like we hoped they would, the sirens disappeared into a dark fog and slipped away into an unseen portal, escaping our grasp. The following days were spent combing every source we could find for any trace of where they might have gone. Our search turned up empty. It was as if they had vanished completely from our world. As I sit here now in my paper-strewn office, the skies outside are darkening over Washington, D.C., leaving me with an uneasy feeling in my gut. We had faced an entity more terrifying than anything we could have ever imagined, and though we sent them away for now, I know that they are not defeated or destroyed. The haunting melody of the siren's call still lingers in my mind, a reminder telling me that they are out there somewhere and that they may return. And if they do, I can only hope that our knowledge and determination will be enough to confront these horrifying beings once again and keep others from falling victim to their deadly allure. I stood in the kitchen of my boss, Connor, nervously clutching a glass of water. Strangely enough, it wasn't the weighty FBI badge pinned to my chest that made this the most unsettling evening of my life. It was the strange sensation that had crept up on me since I arrived at his farmhouse in rural Arkansas for this impromptu dinner, an unexplainable feeling of growing dread. Connor glanced around as he spoke, pausing only when a roaring laugh spilled effortlessly from him. So I said... You call that a demogorgon? My goldfish is scarier. He guffawed, along with his wife, Vera, and their friends, Dave and Sarah, the latter two visitors from my agency division. The laughter rang uncomfortably in my ears as I excused myself to find the restroom. The quiet sound of footsteps interrupted my aimless wandering through the dim hallway. The shadowy figure emerging sent chills down my spine. It was Connor's teenage son, Cole, except something was off about him. His features seemed contorted unnaturally, and his eyes had subtle hints of blood in them. With a tense smile and avoiding eye contact, I stepped around him and dashed into the next room. Suddenly, words began spilling out of me as I narrated what had happened to Dave and Sarah. Don't you think it's weird? I pressed, my voice frantic. All these creepy incidents happening around this house? Dave rubbed his temples and looked uneasy. I don't know. Connor did say they've been having some issues with wild animals. But something more sinister lingered in the air than mere fauna. We all felt it. Outside, amidst the cacophony of crickets and cicadas under a haunting moonlit sky invisible through thick tree branches, loomed a steady unease. Despite any reasonable explanation based on daily work chasing legendary creatures, what none would acknowledge was how much we dreaded uttering that fear aloud for it would only bring a new terror. Suddenly, a piercing scream tore through the tense atmosphere, shattering our fragile veneer of safety. We scrambled madly to its origin, finding Vera crumpled in the hallway, shaking uncontrollably, her finger pointing at the locked door of Cole's room opposite her. Panicking, I kicked the door down violently, only to find even more heart-palpitating madness. Cole's lifeless body suspended from the ceiling in an eerie crucifix position, deep gashes visible across his limbs as blood oozed disgustingly on the floor. I fought down vomit as Dave muttered hoarsely. This was no animal. Eyes wide with terror, we stumbled out of the room. Within seconds, Connor was at our side, demanding answers. Sarah whispered the words he didn't want to hear. Your son, Cole, he's dead. The sound of something heavy slamming against wood echoed through the night. The front door had been closed and locked too tightly. No matter how much force we exerted in our adrenaline-fueled attempts to escape, it remained motionless. 
the worst truth hadn't revealed itself yet. We were trapped. As we moved in panicked pairs throughout Connor's darkened home, searching for a means of escape, Dave beckoned me into a dusty basement corner. Unreadable fear pinched his face as he handed me an old Polaroid picture from atop a dented steel filing cabinet. An abhorrent depiction met my eyes. Children with familiar faces surround an unspeakable monstrosity, defying natural order and comprehension. There were too many limbs and grotesquely gaping maws in so many places where mouths should never be. My vision was swimming, and my finger traced their unrecognizable childhood incarnations on the frayed paper. Beside me, Dave sagged against the wall, stuttered, and became entrapped in disbelief. I remember this. I remember this creature. Horror intertwining our festering gazes, we stared at the image as sirens from emergency service vehicles drew nearer. A wretched sight never leaving our memories, even if we lived to see another day. A single tortured scream filled the air, guttural and bone-chilling. I knew it belonged to Connor. As desolation and terror welled within me, something within me urged me towards the sound originating from an innocent-looking room. I entered the room trembling and with caution. I was met by a grisly scene. Connor lay on the floor, writhing in agony, his body contorted and twisted at unnatural angles. Dave and Sarah stood near him, horrified expressions painted across their faces. "'What did this to him?' I asked with a shaky voice. Sarah looked at me, eyes filled with dread. "'We don't know. We just found him like this.' Before I could process the events unfolding before me, a sickening crack echoed through the room as Connor's body snapped and twisted further into an agonizing, unrecognizable form. His anguished cries intensified. Desperate for help, but reluctant to leave the others alone, we managed to contact authorities using Dave's radio transmitter. The operator assured us that help was on its way, but we couldn't ignore the nagging feeling that for Connor, time was running out. The next few hours were hellish. We divided our time between caring for Connor and searching frantically through old crates and worn-out books in hopes of finding anything that would explain what was happening to him or how to stop it. Then Sarah stumbled upon a cave art drawing found among an assortment of ancient artifacts. A menacing figure loomed over fleeing villagers amidst chaos and destruction. As we examined it more closely, one thing became chillingly clear. The creature in the drawing bore an uncanny resemblance to the monstrous abomination from the Polaroid picture. Having no other leads or choice, we searched for answers by connecting with a renowned archaeologist via Dave's radio transmitter. He described a malevolent force that fed upon fear and pain named Kefas. This terrible creature had been responsible for countless acts of carnage throughout history. Kefas thrived on terror itself. With this newfound knowledge and heart-pounding fear coursing through us, we devised a plan. To set fire to the farmhouse, hoping that, by doing so, we would destroy the demon's source of power and free Connor from its grip. We wasted no time in carrying out our plan. Taking containers of gasoline from an old shed, we doused the walls and floors before hastily retreating outside. Sarah held a trembling hand over her eyes as Dave flicked a lit cigarette into the house. The fire ignited with an explosive fury, rapidly consuming everything in its path. As the flames roared around us, we stood petrified and unable to look away. The night was illuminated with an unnatural glow as black smoke billowed into the sky. And then it happened. A gut-wrenching scream emerged from within the inferno. It sounded like Connor. But then another scream pierced through the chaos, this time from one of us. We turned to see Dave collapse onto the ground, convulsing violently. Sarah and I exchanged fearful glances as we realized Kefas had passed on to another victim. The firefighters and police officers arrived moments later. Thoroughly exhausted, grief-stricken, and emotionally drained, we shared our horrifying story with them. They took our statements but were hesitant to believe our tale of Kefas, though they took note of it for further investigation once the ashes settled. Sarah looked into my eyes, tears streaming down her face. What now? she asked with a quivering voice. My lips formed a bitter smile, and resignation was heavy in my throat as I looked back at her. We keep fighting, Sarah, and in that moment, we both knew one dismal truth. As long as Kefaz existed, terror lived within us all.
The evening of December 2nd, 2014, began like any other during my tenure with the FBI's Special Paranormal Division. My name is John Waters, and you may think my daily life consists of dealing with werewolves or vampire-like beasts. Oddly enough, though, that's not the reality. Most of my cases end up being hoaxes, people trying to justify their irrational fears of the unknown with superstition. My wife Emily and I were having dinner at a small Italian restaurant in downtown Salt Lake City. We were laughing about something stupid that happened the other day. Emily had accidentally shattered her coffee mug by sneezing at the wrong moment. Man, the expression on her face was priceless. It was the rare moment when we could enjoy a nice meal together without discussing our problems or work-related stress. But as fate would have it, that peaceful evening was about to take a sinister turn. As we were finishing our tiramisu and espresso, I received a distress call from one of my contacts in local law enforcement. There had been reports of bizarrely mutilated animal corpses found near a hiking trail in Utah's Uinta Wasatch Cache National Forest. This information usually doesn't amount to much more than some animal-related accidents or people with overactive imaginations. However, the urgency in the officer's voice piqued my curiosity. I sighed and looked at Emily apologetically when a thought crossed my mind. All right, just one more case. I needed to see what was going on this time. She understood and even encouraged me to go out there while making her mental schedule for tomorrow's grocery shopping list instead. Upon arrival at the site, I couldn't help but notice the sheer carnage littering the forest floor, coupled with an unmistakable stench of decay looming in the air. Something had ravaged this area all right. Amidst splintered branches and leaves stained with blood, I spotted what appeared to be a shredded tent and the remnants of a campsite scattered all around. My field investigator instincts kicked in as I began examining the horrific scene carefully. The perpetrators left a mess behind. While I was photographing the scene, I realized that this didn't look like the work of ordinary human beings or animals. The cuts on the trees were precise and disturbingly symmetrical, and the way the animals' bodies were sliced and disregarded showed a malicious intent that went beyond simple hunger. Suddenly, I spotted something that sent chills down my spine. Human footprints smeared with blood and reptilian-like marks beside them? This wasn't just some prank gone wrong. There was an actual aphile force at work here, unlike anything we'd ever encountered before. As my heart rate picked up, I felt drawn by an unknown force into pursuit. Whoever, or whatever, had done this needed to be stopped before more lives were lost. I radioed for backup and began following those unusual tracks deeper into the woods, determined to apprehend and unmask the otherworldly perpetrator before any collateral damage occurred. From my position lurking just behind the trees, something scaly yet humanoid emerged from behind nearby shrubbery. Its eyes flickered hurriedly with unmistakable intelligence as they searched for any sign of pursuers or enemies. One detail left out from previous adrenaline-filled dispatches, razor-sharp claws jutting roughly three inches off each finger. No doubt about it, this was our target. As sickening as it was to confront such an abomination at close range, my thoughts went back to Emily waiting for me at home. Anger started bubbling inside me. How dare it disrupt our peaceful life like this? Determination built up within me to take down this creature once and for all, even if we didn't know how or where it came from. Suddenly, it let out an ear-splitting screech as though inviting me into a showdown. I was so thrilled with the opportunity that I had no other option but to answer its call. No more! I shouted, fueled by righteousness, as I charged toward the creature, gun drawn. As I charged toward the creature, it hissed defiantly and swiped at me with its razor-sharp claws. I narrowly dodged the attack, feeling the air slice as the claws passed mere inches away from my face. Unfazed, I aimed my gun and fired a shot at the hideous being, but to my disbelief it barely flinched, as if the bullet was nothing more than a minor annoyance. Running low on options, I knew I needed to come up with a different plan. This wasn't just any creature from folklore or myth. It was something far more dangerous and powerful than anything we had encountered before. As I attempted to put some distance between myself and the monster, I couldn't help but wonder why I hadn't called for help yet. It seemed foolish now. I knew that trying to fight this alone would be risky, but something in me told me that involving others could result in even more casualties. Moreover, 
I didn't want to endanger Emily or put any more lives at risk. The creature lunged at me again, forcing me into a desperate game of evasion through the thick brush of trees and bushes. We danced around each other in an intricate display of combat finesse. Suddenly my phone rang. The ringtone cut through the tense atmosphere like a knife through butter, setting off a flurry of emotions in both me and the creature. Startled by the sound, it momentarily lost its focus, giving me an inadvertent opportunity to escape its grasp. Seizing this small window of opportunity, I sprinted away from the beast, using deafening silence as my ally. Not daring to glance back while adrenaline coursed through my veins that numbed everything but my survival instinct. Later that night, after I managed to escape back to civilization and report my findings to my superiors, they informed me that they'd received reports of similar incidents in neighboring states. They surmised that the creature I encountered was known as the Keldane, a malicious ancient entity whose sole purpose was spreading chaos and destruction. As I lay in bed next to Emily, pretending to be asleep, my head was filled with unanswered questions and conflicting thoughts. Shouldn't I have called for help? Was my action truly rational? But perhaps more importantly, why was the Keldane here? What were its intentions? The next day, I received an anonymous tip from a shrouded source who claimed to share some insight on how to subdue the seemingly invincible Keldane. Their motivations remained unknown, but their confidence in their knowledge left me intrigued and unnerved. I hesitantly agreed to follow the mysterious individual's guidance. As night fell once again, I prepared myself for another encounter with the vicious Keldane. Little did I know that my journey would not only alter my perception of reality, but also force me down a path I never thought possible. With every step taken towards that malefic figure in those blood-soaked woods, dread filled each passing second. The horrifying battle felt unending, as if time itself had come to a standstill. And still, against all odds, we fought on. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months, until finally it happened. Their plan pushed the Keldane to retreat into an uncharted abyss, where no man or creature dared venture before. And so our lives resumed as best they could, given the gravity of what transpired between us. Sometimes, while laying in bed next to Emily or walking through bustling city streets, I found myself lost in thought while reminiscing about that eerie night in Utah and its sinister aftermath. Only one thing remained certain. The world would never be the same after our encounter with the Keldane. The lingering otherworldly aura trailed behind it like an inescapable curse upon humanity haunting dreams and chilling souls. Yet the question remained, just what was the Keldane's true purpose? And would it ever emerge back into the desperate and vulnerable end of mankind once more? The morning was unexpectedly chilly as I started my day with a simple cup of coffee cracking a small smirk at the barista's questionable attempts at humor. It was the kind of joke that only friends who'd spent months together would find amusing. Despite a long career in the FBI, I still managed a small, genuine laugh at their efforts before walking out of the crowded cafe. My assignment for that day was to investigate some eerie occurrences in Crestview, Florida. Though I'm usually tasked with hunting supernatural beings, this investigation seemed relatively normal. Missing person cases and strange noises heard in a network of local caves. As someone who's always been skeptical about such matters, I didn't expect to encounter anything otherworldly. Arriving at the local precinct, I met with Detective Stan Lockerbie, an older gentleman with silvery hair. We exchanged pleasantries before delving into discussing the case, going over relevant background information, and poring through available documents. By the way, what kind of food do you like? asked Stan. I know this great place nearby. Burgers and more. Sounds perfect to me. I agreed with an approving nod. As Stan and I surveyed the caves that afternoon, we noticed claw marks engraved into the cave walls and followed them deeper inside. There was something undeniably peculiar about these markings. They were far too intricate and deliberate to have been crafted by some wild animal. After grabbing our quick burger lunch and regrouping inside the cave system once more, Stan discovered one of the missing locals lying on the cold ground, unconscious but alive. Her clothing was torn in multiple places, and fresh wounds bled from various deep gashes on her limbs. 
Panic began to set in as we realized there had to be more to this case than just simple disappearances. This wasn't just a job for local law enforcement. There was genuinely something monstrous lurking in these caves. As we continued our search through the winding caverns, we came across a gruesome tableau of mutilated remains. It seemed that whatever had attacked the woman we found earlier had also brutally savaged these unfortunate souls. It was a sight that couldn't help but make you sick to your stomach. A perfect example of how cruel and merciless the unknown could be. Darkness fell quickly, cloaking the surroundings in an almost palpable layer of fear. The only light came from our flickering flashlights as we ventured deeper, guided more by instinct than certainty. I could feel Stan's growing unease alongside mine. What could have possibly caused this senseless violence? It wasn't long before we discovered the answer. When our flashlight beam settled on a horrifying figure lurking within the shadows, its grotesque features paralyzed us with fear. The creature had elongated limbs and claws dripping with foul, viscous liquid. Its eyes were two dark voids staring menacingly back at us. Frozen under the sheer weight of terror, Stan managed to choke out his question. What is that thing? I have no idea, I whispered back. The confrontation that followed was brutal and chaotic, a fight for survival fueled by adrenaline and desperation. While both Stan and I dodged its vicious swipes and lunges, I fired off several rounds from my handgun, leaving small bursts of its putrid ichor splattered on the cave walls. Incapable of shouting or thinking clearly amidst the unfolding horror, I could only attempt to stupefy the monstrous being before us long enough for a proper escape. As the creature relentlessly pursued us, our collective breaths came in shallow gasps, and our bodies ached with exertion. Stan and I scrambled through the network of caves, nearly tripping over rocks and narrowly avoiding ledges. It was as if we were trapped in a living nightmare with no end in sight. We need to find a way out of here, Stan shouted, his voice strained and hoarse. A sudden increase in the creature's gut-wrenching screeches indicated that it was closing in on us. In desperation, we took shelter behind a large rock formation, and tried to figure out our next move. The sound of the creature's persistent approach was seemingly everywhere, echoing through the labyrinthine caves. I'll call for help, I whispered, realizing that it was our only hope. Stan nodded his agreement, though he was also visibly hesitating at not being able to call for help himself. But there wasn't any time for explanation or second-guessing. I hastily pulled out my satellite phone and dialed the emergency number. With bated breath, we waited as the call rang through. Finally, someone answered. Hello? We need immediate assistance. We're in a cave system near Crestview. There's some monstrous creature hunting us. I blurted it out. We're dispatching a team immediately. Hold on. The voice on the other end replied before disconnecting. As relief washed over us, our short-lived respite was brought to an abrupt end by an ear-piercing shriek. The sinister being had found us. With newfound energy fueled by fear, we bolted from our hideout and made a dash toward the cave entrance. There was no time to consider alternate routes. Escape was all that mattered. Crashing through the cave opening like desperate fugitives, we stumbled into daylight just as backup arrived. They looked bewildered by our erratic entrance, but their confusion quickly turned to horror as they caught sight of the creature trailing behind us. It hesitated at the entrance its dark, void-like eyes scanning the scene before vanishing back into the caves. Hours later, with our nerves still rattled from the encounter, we were interviewed and debriefed by our colleagues. The locals in town shared hushed whispers about the terror we had faced within those ancient caverns, referring to it as the Umbridge, a creature born of darkness that feasted upon any unfortunate soul who dared enter its domain. As they recounted horrifying tales of ancient legends and personal losses tied to the umbrage, Stan hesitantly explained why he hadn't called for help earlier. It turned out he had lost his wife to the same mysterious creature years prior. In his grief and guilt, he was unable to confront his past and the umbrage's existence, until he witnessed it with his own eyes. But how do we know it's the same creature? I asked. An old woman with deep sorrow in her eyes replied, the scratches on its victims, those are its signatures. Folks around here know that when they see those marks, the umbrage was responsible. With that chilling revelation hanging in the air, Stan and I silently shared looks of dread and certainty. 
there was no denying what we had faced. The umbrage was real, and we had met it face to face. The investigation continued as the area was cordoned off by authorities. Despite tireless efforts made by law enforcement and seasoned hunters alike, the umbrage remained elusive, a dark stain on Crestview's soulful history. As for me, I couldn't forget what I had seen or shake off the feeling that maybe, just maybe, the umbrage wasn't done with me yet. Aaron, you shouldn't be joking around about these things, I shouted across the dimly lit office. Aaron, of course, had just finished regaling me with another one of his wild tales from our time working in the cryptid and paranormal division of the FBI. The man never seemed to run out of stories. It's not a joke, Jim, Aaron replied earnestly. This one is serious. I checked the records multiple times myself. All the accounts match up too closely for it to be a coincidence. It was May 18, 2002, and we were stationed in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Normally, our division doesn't receive too many cases that are considered high priority, but this time was different. Horrifying reports kept trickling in from a town 60 miles south of Cheyenne, named Amorosa. Images flooded my mind as I recalled ghastly descriptions from witnesses, mutilated animals left in piles by some unseen terror, unnerving screams emanating from the woods every night for weeks on end. It was disturbing, even for someone who had been working on these kinds of cases for years. Aaron continued explaining his pet theory about how all these incidents were connected, involving a creature he dubbed the Amorosa Mangler. Aaron refused to share any useful information until there was only one possible explanation left. Something sinister was lurking in Amorosa. Sighing deeply, I asked Gary, our field partner, to wrap things up so we could set off to investigate Amorosa firsthand. If Aaron's hunch proved correct, then we were likely dealing with an obscure and dangerous cryptid that had somehow gone unnoticed until now. The following day found us astounded by what we uncovered during our investigation in Amorosa, unlike anything I had ever encountered during my career with the FBI. We met up with several townspeople who shared with us more eyewitness accounts, and we even saw firsthand the devastating aftermath of animal attacks that matched previous reports. At first, we believed the perpetrator to be an unknown species of predator. However, when we began piecing together its hunting patterns, or rather lack thereof, it became apparent that this creature seemed to be attacking sporadically and without reason. We were dealing with something deliberately cruel and malevolent. Late one evening, as the sun dipped beneath the horizon and darkness enveloped the town, we found ourselves deep within a dense forest on the outskirts of Amorosa, I felt a chill sweep over me as the temperature dropped, goosebumps creeping along my arms. It was eerily quiet. Too quiet. Without warning, a gut-wrenching scream pierced the unnerving silence. Gary leaped into action, darting through the brush with a flashlight in hand, while Aaron and I followed closely behind. Our heartbeats raced as fast as our feet over the uneven forest floor. Suddenly we stumbled upon a gruesome scene. Laid out before us were remains so savagely brutalized that they were barely recognizable as humans, limbs torn apart from torsos and innards scattered across the clearing. The vile stench of rotting flesh assaulted our senses. We continued further into the woods, our flashlights probing through the encroaching shadows until they finally settled on an enormous silhouette at least nine feet tall, lurking among the trees. It looked like no mythological creature I'd ever known. Its leathery skin was dotted with scars, while dark, matted fur obscured parts of its grotesque body. Its piercing yellow eyes met my own in terrifying clarity. The realization hit me like a freight train. Aaron had been right all along. The monstrous figure bolted from its hiding place, moving with terrifying agility as it disappeared into the dense forest. We sped towards where we had last seen the creature, knowing we needed to find it, or that warning the residents of Amorosa wouldn't be enough. As we followed the trail left behind by the Amorosa Mangler, its path of destruction grew clearer. Blood-stained leaves and damaged trees led us deeper into the woods. Faint whispers began to emerge from the town's local folk that hinted at an ancient legend of a demon named Zolthar inhabiting these forests centuries ago. Armed with this new information, we couldn't help but think that Zolthar and Amorosa Mangler were one and the same. 
we decided to consult an expert in folklore and demonology, hoping they would provide insight into Zolthar's motives and how to protect Amorosa without simply eliminating it. After interviewing local historians and shaman-like figures, we came across a shrouded elderly lady who claimed to have seen Zolthar herself. She spoke of a pattern of ritualistic sacrifices conducted by Zolthar to maintain immortality, an eerie practice in which individuals endured unspeakable agonies before succumbing to death as their life force fueled Zolthar's own. Horrified yet fixated on stopping this brutal practice, we set out with renewed determination into the domain of Zolthar. In an odd turn of fortune, we managed to track the beast down in its lair, a vast network of underground caves. Realizing that notifying other agents would put them at grave risk and that our chances were slim, we resolved to face Zolthar alone while formulating a plan to somehow pacify it instead of attempting a single-handed capture or kill. Our lives weighed heavily on us as we prepared for what could potentially be our final confrontation. Two nights later, under a moonless sky, we advanced into the heart of the cave system. There, amidst pools of congealing blood and discarded bones, we found Zolthar feasting on the remains of another unfortunate victim. It seemed to savor each bite and drink in every tortured scream. The sight was abhorrent beyond words, but it steeled our resolve that this simply could not continue. With all the courage we could muster, Aaron threw a vial of holy water laced with a potent herb that the elderly woman who had previously encountered Zolthar had recommended. As it struck the creature's body, it shrieked in agony while convulsing violently, weakened by a force it had never experienced before. In that brief moment of vulnerability, we managed to bind it using chains etched with ancient runes, runes that had once contained Zolthar centuries prior. The mangler writhed and thrashed in a bid to free itself, but found no escape from its new confinement. Exhausted and relieved, we could hardly believe our success. At long last, Amorosa would be safe from this monstrous tormentor. Or so we thought. An unsettling fear crept into our minds as we exited the cave system with Zolthar bound behind us. What if all our knowledge and efforts had been erroneous or misguided? What if there were forces at work far beyond what we could comprehend? What if Zolthar was only the beginning? As we entered the town and relayed our encounter to an eager crowd, that fear continued to nag at us a lingering unease that reminded us that while Zolthar may have been restrained for now, evil persists in many forms. And perhaps one day in the future beyond our time in Amorosa or another small town in America's heartland, that evil will once again manifest itself, seeking revenge on those who dare to stand against it. It was a sweltering afternoon in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on June 14, 2009. I'd just finished a long day of paperwork for the Special Division of the FBI, and as usual, I had a desperate craving for nachos. Little did I know that this specific craving would change my life permanently. I reached Chipotle with my former partner at work, Monica Pierce. We worked together for years and shared a bond stronger than friendship, I parked near the entrance and wiped beads of sweat from the invasive heat outside. As we delved into our nachos, we laughed at the absurdity of our daily rituals and the merry-go-round that is adult life. As we tossed another jest at each other's dining etiquette, a sudden gut-wrenching scream pierced the air. Dropping our nachos in terror, we dashed out into the street and saw a woman frantically pointing towards a nearby alleyway. Her face was streaked with tears, her clothes disheveled, Clearly something horrifying had happened. Racing into the dimly lit alleyway, closely followed by Monica, I saw an unsettling scene that couldn't have been from this world. A hulking figure stood over the body of another person who looked like they'd been mauled beyond human recognition. The creature locked its glowing red eyes with mine for an unnerving few seconds before lunging up the side of a brick building and scuttling away like a spider on speed. What in God's name was that thing? Monica gasped as she peeked around me. Beats me, I replied shakily as we rushed over to assess the scene. The mutilated victim was dreadful to behold. Now only twisted flesh and viscera were laid out in an abstract art form of violence and gore. As we took photos and collected evidence while local law enforcement arrived to seal off the area, 
I couldn't help but catch myself glancing back toward the rooftop where the malevolent entity had vanished. Over the next few weeks, stories of gruesome deaths and bizarre encounters with the creature spread like wildfire throughout Baton Rouge. It left us scrambling to find explanations and scrambling to ensure public safety as well. We convened group discussions, liaised with other departments, and consulted experts in biology, religion, cryptids, and even folklorists. Our team was hot on its heels when we discovered another crime scene in an abandoned warehouse near the Mississippi River. As we entered the dank premises with our flashlights swaying ominously, the air felt thick with a palpable sense of dread. Everybody, keep your wits about you, I cautioned, as we swept through the building inch by inch, nervous energy coursing through our veins. In one corner of the warehouse stacked with rusted drums, we found what we'd been searching for, though not in the state anyone anticipated. Clinging to a wall fifteen feet in the air was a man suspended by cables, his body resembling a twisted marionette. The cables cut deep into his flesh, the spider's legs extending out from around his spine and into his back muscles. Sorry, I couldn't control... It was scratched onto one of those old, rotting walls, likely scrawled there by the poor soul before he met his gruesome fate. As we examined this sickening scene more closely, there came another scream from Monica's partner, Emily. Turning in shock, expecting to see Emily confronted by the monster's cruel presence, relief washed over me as I noticed that she was pointing at a piece of paper lying on a table across from her. On this torn page was evidence of an intricate symbol, one that seemed to trigger an instinctive reaction of nausea deep within my stomach after the slightest glimpse at it. We decided to take the mysterious symbol to a renowned historian and researcher, Dr. Emily Clark. We needed answers and hoped that she could give us some insight into the bizarre events that had been happening in Baton Rouge. Upon presenting the torn page to Dr. Clark, her eyes narrowed, and she hesitated for a moment before agreeing to study it. We left her office with a mixture of anticipation and unease, wondering what we had unveiled in the depths of our investigation. In the following days, more reports of encounters with the menacing creature and gruesome deaths flooded our inboxes. Each story seemed more horrifying than the last. Victims hung from trees by their own entrails or impaled on makeshift crosses made of gnarled branches. It became clear that we were dealing with something none of us had ever faced before, something sinister and relentless. Dr. Clark finally called us back to her office, visibly shaken but determined to share her findings. She explained that this creature had origins in ancient folklore, a demonic beast known as Barghest, said to bring death and chaos in its wake. The inexplicable symbol found at the crime scenes appeared to be connected to Barghest, an invocation or possibly even a means of control. I exchanged a concerned glance with Monica as we realized we were no longer dealing with mere monster attacks, but something much more deeply rooted in dark mythology. We couldn't let this horror continue. We needed to find the source of this unstoppable force before more lives were lost. Our team decided it was time for drastic measures. It was time to set a trap for Barghest and figure out how it might be controlled or at least contained. With very little information about how such an unheard of creature may operate, we came up with the idea to lure it using the symbol as bait. After carefully setting up an abandoned building as our trap site, we painted the unholy symbol in blood across its walls, mimicking the scene from the warehouse. We concealed ourselves and waited. The air was thick with tension, with every creak or rustle jolting our nerves. And then it arrived. Hidden from view, we watched as the ghastly form of Barghest crawled into the room. A massive snarl escaped its throat, echoing against the crumbling walls. It stopped short of the symbol before swinging its sinister red gaze towards our hiding spots. It was as if it sensed our presence, knowing that it was being tricked. Monica jumped out before I could stop her. Bravery or recklessness, it was hard to tell which drove her to confront the beast head-on. As it turned its attention towards her, she stoically held up a mirrored surface etched with the haunting symbol. For a moment, time stood still. None of us dared breathe, fearing that any movement would shatter the fragile balance we had created. Then, with an unearthly howl that seemed almost pained and angry, Barghest scrambled up a wall and disappeared through one of the shattered windows. Though we hadn't managed to capture or kill the monster, we knew now that there might be a way to combat its terror, through investigating more about its history and finding a potential weakness in its connection to the cryptic symbol. And so, 
Our hunt for Barghest continued with renewed determination, though often it felt as if we were nipping at its hooves rather than getting any closer to catching it. As we ventured further into this nightmare, Monica and I remained inseparable, both shackled by shared determination and haunted by those we had lost. The memory of what once were humor-filled dinners is replaced by images of ruined lives, all marked by those chilling symbols. While the battle against Barghest still rages on today, silently stalking from behind headlines and whispered tales, I need you to know that there are those who stand against the darkness, even when it feels too powerful to overcome. And until our story ends, we will remain vigilant, prepared for the day when we might finally put an end to it and reclaim peace for our beleaguered city. It was Wednesday, June 6, 1984, when everything went to hell. As an FBI agent working for a secret division known as the Cryptid Hunters, I had seen my fair share of bizarre assignments. But what happened that evening will forever be etched into my memory. I was stationed in Savannah, Georgia, working on a case involving reports of strange happenings around River Street. I had just sat down at a local bar, the Grey Whale, to meet my informant. He was a well-built man in his mid-forties named Ethan Miller, he had salt and pepper hair and was nursing a pint of some local craft beer. We exchanged pleasantries as I hoped to ease his nerves. You know they call this the ghost beer, Ethan nervously joked, pointing at his pint. Brewed next door in the haunted Moonweather Brewery. Just a little city trivia for you. Our conversation started with talk of local ghost legends. Maybe we both needed the icebreaker. Pretty soon, however, Ethan began telling me about an odd string of recent occurrences mutilated livestock and unidentifiable tracks found nearby. It was believed that some kind of creature was responsible, but no one could ever catch a clear glimpse of it. Two days ago he encountered the thing while he was walking home from work late one night, and it irrevocably changed him. Distraught and panicked as he shuffled through his pocket to pull out his phone, he managed to snap a blurry photo before it disappeared into the shadows of an old cemetery. The photo showed something tall with elongated arms ending in viciously sharp talons. Its body was twisted and unnatural in appearance, like it defied all the rules of biology. At first, I thought Ethan's story sounded eerily similar to other local urban myths about cryptids and creatures that I'd heard before, but this was different. With each new report, victims shared the same sense of dread. They all described unsettling encounters with this otherworldly being. As I tried to process what Ethan told me, we heard a blood-curdling scream outside. We rushed out of the bar and into the cobblestone street, where we found a young woman in shock, staring wide-eyed at her torn and tattered purse. She described an unseen assailant who had grabbed it from her shoulder before dashing off into an alleyway. Ethan and I exchanged worried looks. Without a second thought, we sprinted towards the alley. The odor of decay assailed our senses as we went deeper into its dark recesses. The air seemed to thicken, and our breaths caught in our throats. An eerie cry echoed through the alley, followed by the sound of scraping metal, or perhaps claws raking against stone. As we crept closer, we found what remained of the woman's purse, shreds of leather and fabric arranged in a grotesque parody of their original form. Suddenly, a figure emerged from behind a nearby dumpster, tall and twisted like the monster in Ethan's photo. Its unnatural limbs caressed the walls of the alley, as if craving the touch of stone on its skin. The more I looked at it, the more my head seemed to throb with pain and darkness. Ethan mustered his courage and yelled out to get its attention. The thing turned toward us, snarling angrily as it bared its needle-like teeth. It lunged in our direction, knocking Ethan out of its path and sending him crashing into nearby garbage cans. I quickly tried to assess the situation as Ethan groaned in pain, clutching his side. There was no time to call for backup. Whoever or whatever this thing was, it was a threat that needed immediate attention. I pulled out my FBI-issued handgun and aimed it at the creature. Stop! I shouted, my voice steady but resolute. The creature merely cackled in response before launching itself towards me. I squeezed the trigger, spraying a hail of bullets at it, yet they seemed to have little effect on the monster's twisted form as it continued to advance. In an act of desperation, I hurled my gun toward the creature, hoping that the impact might at least slow it down. It didn't. 
Instead, it closed the distance between us and took a swipe at me with its talons. I managed to dodge most of its strikes, but one connected with my arm, leaving deep gashes that rapidly started to bleed. The pain was intense and throttled my ability for rational thought. However, despite being wounded and having no viable weapon left, I knew I had to do something. Pushing through the pain, I grabbed a heavy metal pipe that had been discarded in the alley and swung it hard toward the creature's head. The impact sent the monster reeling for a moment and momentarily dazed it. Seizing my chance, I helped Ethan to his feet, and together we stumbled out of the alley onto River Street, where confused bystanders gawked at our disheveled appearance. Knowing we couldn't stay there like sitting ducks, I suggested we retreat to the Grey Whale for cover until we could figure out what we were dealing with. Limping back inside the bar, Ethan called County General Hospital while I contacted our local FBI office. Though both were only blocks away and soon arrived to provide assistance, their efforts proved fruitless, as no signs remained of the horrifying creature, save for the shredded purse and a handful of casings from my gun. Over the next few days, I spearheaded an extensive search of the area, only to find that the mutilated livestock reports had ceased. It seemed as if the creature had vanished as swiftly as it appeared. In an attempt to learn more about what happened that fateful night, I headed to the local library and pored over books on mythology and folklore. I eventually came across a passage mentioning a demon called Phinos, which was known for its elongated limbs, sharp talons, and twisted form. The similarities between this monster and what Ethan and I had faced were uncanny. When I mentioned Phinos in passing to a colleague who had connections with a mysterious European sect specializing in dealing with supernatural creatures, she confirmed my suspicions. The sect was aware of Phinos's presence in Savannah, and during their investigation, they discovered several other similar incidents that spanned back decades. Phinos was seemingly attracted to negative energy and fed itself on fear, qualities that could explain why the creature had targeted various individuals in our city. At this point, there wasn't much more that could be done. My FBI colleagues admonished me for pursuing supernatural occurrences but couldn't ignore my results. Ethan recovered from his injuries but was adamant on leaving Savannah permanently to avoid further encounters with otherworldly beings. And me? As exhausted as I was by this harrowing experience, I couldn't deny that there were more creatures out there, perhaps even more terrifying than Phinos, waiting to prey on our world. And every night before going to sleep, when shadows from my bedroom window crawled up the wall toward me, my pulse raced just a little faster. Looking back now at the horrifying incident that took place in Savannah years ago, where a demonic Phinos tormented people and fed on their fear, that event seemed a distant memory. And though no one initially believed my story, dismissing it as mere fabrications and work-related stress, there was something undeniably eerie about that monster, something that always reminded me of the darkness lurking just below the surface of our everyday lives. The sun had barely risen above the horizon as I drove into the small town of Warrensville, North Carolina, stopping for a quick drive through Donut and Coffee Run. My name is Jack Fletcher, and I am an agent for an off-the-record division of the FBI that specializes in hunting cryptids, monsters, and all sorts of supernatural beings. It was early 2003, specifically on March 23rd when this event took place. Back then, I had no idea what horrors awaited me on this classified mission. As soon as I arrived at my temporary office set up in a local motel room with beige walls and worn-out carpeting, the phone rang. The voice on the other end was my colleague from the Bureau. Jack, we've got a real doozy. Our intel suggests something sinister has been leaving torment and chaos in its wake all over town. Locals are accusing each other of witchcraft or worse. I scoffed at the notion of witchcraft not because I doubted its existence, but because the accusation itself was so cliché within our line of work. All right, I replied. I'll see what's going on. As a skeptic by nature, I couldn't help but wonder if there was a simpler explanation to explore. My first stop was to interview local businessman Dalton Wells, who claimed he'd seen something terrifying near his diner late one night after closing. The man was all nerves as we chatted. Like myself, he wasn't one to believe in monsters. Welding goggles, he managed to stammer out. Excuse me. I prodded for more information. 
Whatever it is out there, Jack, it's got welding goggles on. Human-shaped, freakishly tall, and smelled like burnt metal. Dalton glanced furtively around his diner as though it might suddenly appear between the tables and stools. Intrigued but not sure if I was entirely convinced, I decided to check out the scene. When I reached the back of the diner, there was just something off about the trash cans and wooden pallets, like they'd been purposefully arranged or desecrated. The sour stench of rotting food lingered in the air, but underneath that was another whiff of something. A sulfurous odor mixed with burning metal, as Dalton had mentioned. Moments later I heard footsteps approaching quickly and spun around to meet the gaze of another agent in my division, Sarah, who had just arrived. We've got a hit, Sarah said, panting heavily from her run. Something's hit the local hospital. Patients are going into delirium. Doctors can't explain it. They say it was like their minds were hijacked by pure terror. As we drove towards the hospital, radio chatter from local law enforcement suggested sightings of a tall humanoid wearing welding goggles were spreading through town. The sun dipped lower and lower, casting elongating shadows on streets lined with panicked civilians looking everywhere for signs of danger. As we walked through the hospital halls, following a trail of overturned wheelchairs and nurses trembling from panic attacks that occurred only moments before our arrival, I could feel my heart hammering in my chest. We reached a room where a terrified doctor stood near a patient convulsing on their bed. It's spreading psychologically, Sarah realized with quiet desperation. Suddenly a scream rang out through the hallways, followed by crashing noises. Sarah and I exchanged glances and sprinted toward the source. As we turned the corner, our eyes locked onto an eerily recognizable figure, disregarding all logic and reason, grinning sinisterly behind welding goggles as it hurled nurses into walls without even touching them. The creature looked right at us with its bizarre mechanical smile twisted into something terrifying. The hospital lights flickered ominously, and then, with a sudden burst of flame from its fingertips, the fiend vanished into thin air, leaving only a trail of chaos and destruction in its wake. Never before had I observed anything so unnatural yet immaculately deliberate. This monster was deadly but visionary, calculating, relentless, and enigmatic. I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe slipping through my veins like ice as we stood there in the darkened hospital hallway. Sarah and I stared at the spot where the creature had vanished, feeling a mix of disbelief and dread. We quickly decided that we needed to find answers, as the being was now a direct threat to our mission. We split up to cover more ground, with Sarah focusing on researching potential supernatural origins, while I pursued leads on someone who might have knowledge about the creature. In the following hours, I questioned locals and picked up small bits of information that seemed significant. There were ancient legends involving creatures that could instill fear in their victims, but nothing quite matched the bizarre nature of this monster. Several people mentioned an old woman who lived on the outskirts of town. They regarded her as somewhat eccentric, claiming she had knowledge about strange creatures and myths. Determined to find any information that would help me understand and stop this fiend, I went to see this woman. As I approached her isolated home, a dilapidated structure nestled among woods and brush, she appeared in the doorway, seemingly waiting for me. Agent Jack Fletcher, she said without making any introduction. Her eyes held wisdom beyond her years as we discussed the welding goggle-wearing monster. Finally, she told me its name, Zenerak. The name carried weight. It left an unsettling feeling in my chest. She explained how Zenerak was an ancient entity capable of inciting uncontrollable fear within its victims while possessing strength beyond human understanding. Meanwhile, Sarah discovered that Zenerak drew its power from an ancient artifact of unknown origin. This artifact seemed closely connected to some secret organization using Zenerak for their twisted purposes. Armed with this knowledge, and aware that calling for backup would be fruitless, we set out to locate the artifact and stop Zenerak once and for all. Having tracked down the artifact's hiding place in an underground tunnel beneath the hospital, we knew there was no time to waste. People were still suffering from Xenorak's attacks. Their anguished cries for help were still echoing in our ears. My heart raced as we embarked on our hazardous mission, traveling deeper and deeper underground. Finally, we found the artifact, a metallic object glowing faintly with unnatural light. As we prepared to destroy it, the air around us suddenly grew cold, making it difficult to breathe. Xenorak had found us. 
The creature swiped wildly at Sarah and caused an enormous stone chunk to fall from the ceiling. In a split second, I leaped out of the way as Sarah barely managed to escape crushing harm herself. The battle against Xenorak was relentless. Our adversary struck without mercy, targeting both me and Sarah with its destructive power. It seemed endless. My legs screamed for rest, but there was no time for that. Xenorak emitted an ear-splitting screech as we continued our struggle. Through sheer willpower and determination, we eventually managed to destroy the artifact. A cacophony of shattering metal echoed through the tunnels as it disintegrated into nothingness. Xenorak's furious expression shifted into horror as it realized the source of its power was now gone. But Xenorak didn't die. It couldn't. Instead, it wrenched open a portal made of shadows and disappeared within moments. We were left standing in the darkness of the demolished tunnel, catching our breaths and feeling grateful to be alive. Back at our temporary office, Sarah and I cleaned up our wounds and tried to process what had just happened. Our experience with Xenorak had left an indelible mark on us. The images of those who'd suffered burned into our minds. Yet there was also relief. We'd sent the creature back where it came from. For now. A phone call interrupted our thoughts. My bureau colleague on the other end told us that another agent had discovered information on a secret organization called the Gellern Order that seemed to be connected not only to Xenorak, but to countless cryptids worldwide. Behind the creature's mysterious name were even greater enigmas awaiting in the shadows, and we'd barely scratched the surface of their sinister goals. The line went silent for a moment before my colleague added, If you thought this was bad, brace yourself. The road ahead only gets darker from here. With that ominous warning ringing in our ears, Sarah and I resolved to continue fighting against the supernatural forces that threatened our world. We left Warrensville knowing that Xenorak might return one day, but when it did, we'd be ready for it. It was my first official day on the FBI's Special Task Force for Paranormal Activity. Not really your regular job title, but that's what it entailed. Our division was responsible for investigating cases that were too creepy or weird for conventional law enforcement agencies. I recall with perfect precision the exact date of August 3, 2021. I clocked in at precisely 7.43 a.m. at the New Orleans field office. Upon my arrival at work, my new confidant and partner, Agent Vlad Simmons, greeted me with a friendly slap on the back followed by an inappropriate joke about vampires and garlic bread. I couldn't help but roll my eyes as I saw the mischievous smirk on his face. Welcome to the freak show. He grinned widely at me. Our assignment seemed simple enough. Investigate a series of bizarre incidents in Baton Rouge related to unexplained markings found outside several city block houses, scratch marks with erratic patterns and deep indentations. It sounded like textbook vandalism until we got there. The air was heavy with humidity as we made our way through the city. An undercurrent of unease made my skin prickle. It was hard to believe anything supernatural could happen in such a seemingly normal place. We headed directly to the site of one of these strange markings, an unassuming beige bungalow on a quiet street. As we got closer to the house, our conversation grew sparse, leaving only an unsettling silence hanging over us. At precisely 4.27 p.m., we arrived at the residence and meticulously inspected the deep scratches etched into the polished hardwood siding. While examining one particular scratch, which seemed to span the height of the building, I found some sort of residue smeared onto its surface, a foul-smelling syrupy ichor that left a knot in my stomach. Hey, Vlad. I beckoned my partner over and commented on its unusual coloration. Come check this goo out. It's like it burns into you he remarked after a moment of studying the substance with a grimace. We then proceeded to visit three more locations that day and discovered similar damage to buildings and the same disgusting residue everywhere. Suddenly, our assignment took on a new angle. The local children reported sightings of a monstrous being around town. It seemed like our perpetrator might be something otherworldly instead of just a delinquent with too much time and energy to spare. That evening, we decided to split up in an attempt to cover more ground. Vlad positioned himself at the first house we investigated earlier that morning, while I kept watch on one of the other sites. We communicated via walkie-talkie, prepared to call in backup if necessary, 
still preferring not to alarm local law enforcement with tales of imaginary hellhounds prowling the streets of Baton Rouge. As I stood there in the dim light from the street lamp, straining my ears for any sound out of the ordinary, I suddenly felt a cold breeze brush against my neck. Startled, I spun around 180 degrees and smacked right into. There it stood before me, an obscenity against nature itself. Mangled black fur covered every inch of its grotesque body. Blood-red eyes fixed upon mine with sheer malevolence as its warped jaw dripped with saliva intermingled with that horrid ichor. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. Flad! I yelled into the walkie-talkie, adrenaline surging throughout my veins. It's here! No response came back. Only silence implied he might also be in trouble. Gritting my teeth, I charged forward toward this monstrous fiend, from which both animals and men had fled since time immemorial. The creature didn't expect my sudden bravery or foolhardiness, but it reacted violently anyway. It unleashed the most ear-piercing shriek. As if it called for something or someone, I watched in horror as more shadows emerged from the dark corners that surrounded us. My hand reached down to grab my sidearm, realizing it might be too late. As I held my sidearm firmly, I aimed at the closest creature, trying to remain calm and focused despite their grotesque appearances. My first shot echoed through the night, hitting its mark on the monster's snarling face. However, these fiends barely reacted to my attack. Without hesitation, I began sprinting back toward the location of my partner Vlad, radioing him while running as fast as my legs could carry me. I'm under attack! Multiple hostiles near my location! There is still no response from Agent Simmons. My heart raced with worry, not just for myself, but also for my partner. Upon arriving at Vlad's location, I found him trapped in a potentially fatal battle with even more of these horrid beasts. Thinking quickly, I fired several shots at the creatures that had circled him, effectively diverting their attention to me. Run! Vlad screamed in between gasps of breath. Together, we sprinted through the deserted streets of Baton Rouge, barely avoiding the crimson claws and gnashing jaws of these abhorrent beings. Meanwhile, we called our colleagues for backup. However, they seemed too far away to provide any immediate assistance. In a brief moment of relief and confusion, we ducked into a small alleyway hidden between two buildings, gratefully acknowledging Lady Luck waiting behind rusted steel garbage containers that shielded us from any pursuer's line of sight. Having decided it was best to catch our breath for a few moments before continuing, both Vlad and I leaned against a damp brick wall while planning our next steps. What are these things? I asked in a low whisper. I don't know, answered Agent Simmons quickly scratching his head before wiping sweat from his brow. We should follow them, he suggested hesitantly. However, his logic seemed sound and fully warranted an investigation into our assailants' further origins, thus anticipating future attacks from these otherworldly beings. With immense caution, we trailed behind what appeared to be the monstrous pack leader, subconsciously following any subtle sound or trace left by these cryptids in the convincing darkness eventually led us to an abandoned farmhouse on the outskirts of town, with very unsettling energy surrounding it. Approaching carefully, we noticed a grotesque symbol etched into the wooden doorframe of the old structure. An injured and frightened man emerged from within the decrepit dwelling, clutching a tattered journal tightly to his chest. Wait, Vlad commanded as I went to help the frail figure staggeringly moving past us. Do you know what these creatures are? Why do they attack? In labored breaths, he revealed that he had accidentally summoned them through an esoteric rite he had discovered in his research. The beasts were known as Kithkamas, ancient beings from another realm thirsting for human blood. It is my fault, the man stammered through tears, offering me the journal where he had found all this dreadful information. I couldn't control them. After carefully studying its contents and illustrations while rapidly processing its implications, we decided to act immediately before any further tragedy could befall Baton Rouge or its citizens. Despite our best attempts, however, we could not stop or capture these demonic entities from continuing their rampage against anything in their path, leaving us with nothing to do but watch helplessly as they disappeared into the night. Our division's backup finally arrived on scene long after the Kithkamas had vanished, 
startled and confused by all the carnage left behind. Vlad hung his head disconsolately as he further pondered how supernaturally fueled creatures continually wreck havoc outside humanity's control. One day our team may successfully contain these hellish monsters, but until then, unspeakable horrors will continue to exist hidden just beneath the surface of our quiet lives, haunting our nightmares and stalking the darkness to remain uncontrollable, unstoppable, and utterly terrifying.